Hello there, and welcome to week 11 of Ad and PR Account Management J364 Online. Of course, as always, I'm your instructor, Michael Betker. Here we are in week 11. Week 11 is all about working with others. One of the ma main things we do, obviously, in this, uh, in this profession is we manage people. Uh, so we're going to talk today about how that looks and what that's like, and frankly, what you know, the people we manage and work with, uh, what their expectations are for success. Uh, both looking at the client side, so in other words, the folks that are paying the bills for us, and then, of course, the folks we work with uh, who make creative things happen uh, for the clients. So um, each have their own sort of unique expectations, so we'll walk through each of those today in lecture. Uh, starting off today, also, I want to just talk about the creative brief a little bit, which is due on Sunday. Uh, talk about five minutes on that, and then uh obviously the lecture, and then I also want to talk a bit about uh, something called account planning, which is a newer sort of uh, facet to the agency world and something you might be akin to. But like I've mentioned before, the account planner is a kind of one part scientist, one part creative, uh, and that mix is very unique and compelling. Uh, and then we'll just wrap up today. So uh, looking at probably about a half hour to 45 minute uh, lecture today. All right. What's due? Now, obviously, we've got a few things going on here. The... Uh, uh, this is a snapshot from our updated syllabus. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that yet, please take a look at that. But obviously, we've got a few things to do here just to kind of get things back on track. And then we'll be back to normal uh, pretty much with regard to when things are due. But um, this week, again, like I said, we're talking about managing uh, people uh, on both sides of it, the client and the creative side. Uh, watch this this uh, lecture video this week, obviously, and then also read Chapter 4 in the Dickinson text. But what's due? Uh, assignment... Uh, the, the brand update number four is due on Thursday, which is this week, uh, April 2nd at midnight. Discussion post number five due also on Sunday. And then uh, we've got uh, assignment four. The creative brief is due on Sunday. And last thing here, of course, is discussion post six due also on Sunday, April 5th. So a fair amount of things to get done. So get a jump on things early this week and you should be just fine. All right, quick direction on the creative briefs. I know we had some, haven't had some time. We've had some kind of distance between the last time we've talked about this. So again, I want to remind you guys what, it, what I'm looking for here. There's five things, and each of these segments is worth five points. The brand manifesto, um, the brand archetype assessment, the positioning statement for your brand, the creative strategy brief for your, uh, for your brand, of course. And then last but not least, just a general kind of overview of spelling and quality of writing is what I'm looking for there to round out that 25 points. So spend some time on this, obviously, and like I said, it's due on Sunday. A um, couple points I want to make is get creative with your manifestos. You know, it's a bit edgy and not meant to be a textbook summary of the brand. It's more of a sort of call to action for uh, internal folks within the brand. Um, the other thing I'll say is get absorbed in the product and find the, the product truth. That's what we do in advertising and marketing. Generally, we're trying to find that one thing that uh, helps a brand rise above everything else. And that's really what we're looking for in uh, captured in a creative brief in, in narrative format. Uh, so last thing I'll say here is just to watch out for grammar and typos. Obviously, that's going to be a, a problem. So anyway, good luck with that. Looking forward to reading those. Um, and there we have it. All right. So let's get into the lecture today. Today is about uh, uh, wants, needs, and expectations for clients and agencies. And I would say more specific clients and creatives. So what do clients want from us, right? And we are the face. Make no mistake, the account person is the face of your agency. So really, you're the one who's going to be the fall guy uh, or, frankly, the one who kind of puts fires out and manages things so that you don't fall. Either way, you're going to be the one playing the front role. Uh, it's like a press secretary almost for, uh, for uh, the president. Um, you're kind of answering questions. You're managing things. But here are a few things. So we're going to run through some of these. There's about maybe eight or ten slides on this here. But uh, some things that you should think about if you're looking to uh, absorb how to be a better account person. First thing they're looking for is somebody who's trusted, right? Proactive and truly interested in the business and acting as a guide or leader. So somebody who not only um, uh, has your back uh, as a client, but also uh, is looking out for, for things and thinking about your business in a very uh, proactive and strategic way. So being trusted that way and not being afraid to, to speak up and uh, suggest things that might help the client. Of course, collaboration goes without saying, but uh, we are partners of the client and obviously an extension of them. Uh, our creative team is meant to kind of take the best parts of the company and make it better. 
Uh, clients today are more involved in what the agency is doing uh, than ever before. Is something I want to mention here as well. So it's not where you throw it over the wall anymore and expect greatness to come back. Clients these days are being more involved. And frankly, that's a good thing for us. The more the clients get involved, the uh, more likely you're going to have a long-term relationship if things are working well. Um, they will look at briefs, they'll look at roughs, and they'll assist with ideas. So we're looking for, uh, if, if I'm a client, I'm looking for agencies who are really good at uh, managing my expectations and involving me in the process. Uh, the last one here is candor, uh, another way of saying uh, tell me like it is. Um, so giving it to them straight and uh, providing them uh, with the reality of the success or failure of any given project. Uh, so they're, again, looking for that trusted partner, which includes candor. They don't want just ads. Um, they have a lot more at stake. Um, their brands, sales, and their careers generally are oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, in, in the crosshairs, um, particularly if it's a, a, a tough economy. So candor is also important. They also want a philosophy of creating change and not just ads. And you see, well, see some examples here today where advertising really can foundationally change a brand's trajectory. Um, so it's not just a tool and it's not just something that's fluffy. It really can be a foundationally a big, big part of, uh, of a company and uh, the way, the direction they take. Um, so you want to have that philosophy of larger change. Um, strong creative work, of course, that's, that's the, the bane of our existence here in, in advertising. We really want to make sure we put our best foot forward here. Um, now, creative for creative sake is, we've talked about that a lot here, but really ultimately having a feel for strategy and understanding kind of the client's uh, competitive set. Who, who are they up against and what has been done in the past and understanding kind of the lay of the land uh, with regard to uh, the, the competition uh, is an important piece of that as well. Um, team members who are customer focused as well. Now, obviously, we're going to be doing this 247 pretty much, answering phone calls and emails all the time. But... Um, you know, our clients oftentimes get caught up in their own world, uh, which, you know, things like brand product details and things like that, our agency must also represent and know the customer. And that's something that's often missing with the client side of things, just really getting to know the target customer in a way that maybe uh, the client hadn't even considered before. We also want integrated thinking, right? So wherever possible, we're looking to, and IMC is kind of what we're talking about there, right? Integrated marketing communication, but by extension, taking everything in and saying, all right, how do we get this done? And what's the best path forward uh, in which we use all of our uh, resources and our efforts and put them into a plan that is concerted and focused and directional? Um, that's called integrated thinking. So it's creative and strategic promotional mix thinking, uh, picking the right tool in the medium for the right job, all of that stuff is important. Certainly consistency, uh, if you're gonna be doing a big campaign for an agency or client, for a client rather, um, you want to make sure that um, you, from top to bottom, from left to right, and from even the smallest ad to the to, to how we can answer the phones, uh, is all consistent. Uh, One-stop shop is best for a client. So if you are the lucky person who's working at a full-service agency, um, clients like the idea of having a, a one place to go, so they don't have to you know call several people. Um, certainly more efficient of the client's time. And it uh, enhances the brand experience because of all the coordination to the consumer. Um, clients also want clear, consistent communication. Now, we talked a lot about that. Communicate, communicate, communicate. You really, honestly, can't over-communicate too much. Uh, I've, I've used email quite effectively, and wherever possible, a well-placed phone call and regular meetings are a great way to stay on top of things. And uh, timely also must be important. So be, being timely and on top of things. So if a meeting happens and you're going to publish the notes, and it's important to get those out quickly, you should get those out quickly. Um, complete and accurate communication as well. So use the tools like we've discussed here in class already. We've already done the conference report and the status reports and emails and phone calls. All of those things should be accurate and consistent. And then wherever possible, over communication. It never hurts to do that unless they tell you otherwise. A good agency team also listens to the client. So it's not lip service or not just fake listening. Uh, we want to do uh, practice what's called active listening um, to make sure that we are uh, engaged with the client. So not listening and proposing ideas that are off strategy is, is important, uh, and that's really the top reason for losing an agency is just not paying attention and going off kind of strategy, even though they may have told you in the initial meetings uh, that uh, and your team still decided to go in a different direction because you thought better. 
that's the number one reason why most agencies lose relationships with the client. Um, so don't discard what you hear. Um, take a listening class. That's a really good idea as well. Listen to, to learn to listen not just to the what's being said, but also the body language, the nonverbal stuff. Uh, make eye contact uh, with your client. Make a strong effort to stay focused on the speaker and don't interrupt. All of those things are called what's called active listening. So look up active listening, and you don't necessarily have to take a class on that, but uh, active listening is something we all can beef up and improve upon. Uh, we're not born with it innately. A lot of us are not born innately as good listeners, but uh, listening is something you can learn. What do clients want? Also, they want a team that takes criticism well and deals with disappointment maturely. Now, that's that's a tough one, right, because you've got – a cadre of very creative folks. Generally, and this is this is a bit of a, um, a stereotype, but I would say it holds true somewhat. Uh, creative folks tend to be a little bit defensive of their work, um, and I can say this for my own self. I tend to be a creative person as well, and when I think an idea is really good, if somebody says it's not good, I take <laughs> I take offense to it. I do. It's just a natural reaction. I think maybe it's not just creatives; it's people in general. But uh, we got to try hard not to be defensive. Uh, we're on the same team. Of course, and sometimes uh, great ideas get killed. We got to just suck that up and take it in. The other thing that happens sometimes too is sometimes budgets get cut or popular clients get fired. We got to rebound quickly and with class uh, wherever possible. So we just got to be really resilient is the key there and uh, be able to take criticism well. Creative thinkers are, you know, in all parts of the team is what they're looking for as well. That's what clients want. They want creative thinkers everywhere. So you're hired for your ideas. That's primarily what it comes down to, right? Is It's just the, the co content and quality of your ideas is what they're looking for. So they want people who can think creatively. Uh, they also want a proactive team. Uh, so you're always going to stay ahead of the client wherever possible and uh, suggest ways that they can grow their business. They also want genuine respect and appreciation for the client and the client's job. Now, I'll say this, you know, account folks, Maybe we're not marketing people, but we should know the four P's. Anytime you work with a client of any note or any stripe, they will have these things to consider. The four P's, product, place, price, and promotion. Now, obviously, we're the fourth P, the promotion piece, but the other three P's are also very important to a client in most cases. In fact, every case. Certainly politics, and a lot of times we're not just talking about politics of the day. We're talking about internal politics and understanding kind of how that works. Who are the folks that are decision makers within the organization? Uh, understanding all of that information. Production problems. Now, that's the other thing, too, is uh, you have to be mindful of, especially if you're making ads and you're creating a, a campaign to, to, for a product that hasn't quite launched yet. A lot of times what happens is there's delays and you've got to kind of change things as they go. So you've got to be, kind of keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on with the client and the products. Uh, sales pressure. Certainly you get sales folks who don't really care about branding. And they more or less care about uh, getting uh, hitting the numbers for the quarter. Uh, so that's something you'll probably deal with as well. And either way, don't badmouth the client to the rest of the agency. Uh, that kills morale and lowers quality, even if they are difficult, right? Especially so. You want to keep it positive and uh, maintain a positive sort of stance in, in spite of some of the bad things that might happen. Because that does kill morale and lower, lower quality overall. Last point here is unpopular lower level clients may be promoted. So watch yourself. Uh, you may find yourself, um, y you know, having a tussle with somebody who at, at one point is is um, kind of a nothing burger manager, mid level manager who suddenly gets promoted, and then suddenly you got you find yourself out on your ear because that relationship has changed. So be careful. Clients also want team members who are presentable. So as much as I I want to believe that. We on the creative side can go in there wearing flip flops and you know our favorite pair of shorts, you know. And so in most cases, that's not going to be the case, right? So you got to be, uh, I would say, you know, minimum dress like the alpha dogs um, uh, on the client side. So look like you fit in with the group that way. So be presentable. Uh, of course, you're you're a part of it. You're an extension of the client's organization now. So you want to act like that, and of course, behave like that. It includes also you know looking the part. You must be able to make persuasive presentations to the client's upper management. So there's some salesmanship involved as well there. So you, know, you might be promote, promoting or selling an idea or an insight about your, your target customer that they hadn't considered before. you got to go in there and evangelize that in such a way that they, they see the point and adopt the strategy. Uh, last couple points here, able to blend into the client's internal culture as much as possible. That's why it's important for us on the front end to understand the culture. Uh, whether it's conservative culture, maybe it's more aggressive, maybe it's more 
uh, creative culture, but either way, understanding your client's culture and then just adopting that as best you can. Um, dress codes, language, work style, all that stuff, right? Your goal is to walk into the organization and assume a high level of acceptance immediately through your homework. So you can't go in cold. You got to understand kind of who you're dealing with. What do they want? They also want anxiety-free service, right? They want reliability, so they want things to show up on time. They want you always to meet deadlines, hit budgets, and don't make mistakes. They also don't want any drama, right? And we have a lot of potential for drama here uh, with all the people we manage. So we're always we're kind of like playground uh, supervisors, almost in a way. Um, you got to make sure you keep the peace on the, clay, uh, on the client side as well as on the creative side, so no drama there. Um, the account person is not not the client should deal with cranky creatives, error-prone media planners behind schedule production departments, et cetera, et cetera. Ideally, the client should never know these things even happen. Um, you are gonna put a face on that and manage things so they don't have to worry about it. Of course, seamless service goes hand in hand with anxiety-free service, uh, looking for everything working in coordination, all team members and external resources working well together, uh, the same high quality across the board, no matter who you are or what team you're working with. Um, United recommendations, so no internal agency division. In other words, you can't go in and have uh, creatives, and I've seen this in some of the pitch episodes we watched, where you've got two creative teams like confronting each other in front of the client, which is an absolute 100% no-no. Uh, so things are going to happen uh, when, when, when personnel change uh, changes happen. So in other words, when people leave the company and you get new people coming in, either way, you've got to maintain that same set of high standards. Um, Last couple points here. Smooth sailing, even when the account manager is gone on vacation. Yeah, right. And then, of course, accurate and timely billing uh, are all things that kind of wrap up the seamless service piece. Clients also want a team that thinks big but pays attention to the small stuff. So detail orientation, that's another one where agencies a lot of times fall down. They get enamored with the creative idea and then don't think about the details. And maybe a creative idea is great, but they're, it's missing the mark on a few things. So you got to think about everything. All, you know, it's like cat herding in a way, but there's a lot of details sometimes in products and services that uh, clients want to promote that you have to be mindful of. So if you mess up the small stuff, they won't include you in the big stuff. So always be detail-oriented. Um, they, they want a team that makes the client look good generally, right? So great creative work certainly is, is at the core of it. Uh, the fact that you've met objectives, and then, of course, if you're training a new person, uh, be discreet about that and bring them up to speed quickly. Either way, they don't want to be bothered by a lot of the stuff that you would be bothered with. Clients also want a pleasant and interesting, interest, and interesting people. A lot of times you got a very conservative company and they think they know everything about the product. They want people to come in and, and show them a different angle and be pleasant and interesting and fun and uh, lively and supportive. And, uh, and frankly, interesting is kind of it. So I've, I've shown a slide on this before, but be dynamic. Dynamics are a very loaded word. There are lots, lots of things going on with that term, but uh, certainly being approachable and interesting is a part of that. Uh, impeccable billings. Now, obviously, billing is, a, is one of the things we have to do. Uh, clients are money people, so sloppy billing will cause big problems and lose trust with them immediately. Uh, toward that end, fair pricing certainly is another thing you want to think about. Um, and actually, this week's discussion post, discussion post six, is all about how to price um uh, a project uh, given a uh, client's predilection for uh, not desiring having comps. So look at that as well. But obviously, how do you price that is one of the questions we'll ask in this week's discussion session. And then flexible work style as well. We're here. We're a service business. So honestly, when you do this kind of work, you're always kind of farming your email or maybe answering phone calls. Uh, but you want to be flexible with your work style. So it's not a nine to five kind of position uh, working in an agency. What do they want? They also want involvement of agency principals, right? So. They want uh, folks high on the, on, the, on the chain to be involved uh, uh, and have a, a stake in the game. So that's, that's super important, obviously, as a part of buy-in. Um, their involvement tells the client the agency thinks the account is important, right? So folks on your side coming in uh, who run the show, uh, coming in and, uh, and showing their support for the relationship that's, that's budding or, or growing or whatever. Uh, so they want to see those folks come in periodically. Uh, they, want to, they want to keep execs informed by copying them on conference reports and some key meetings as well. So you may find it's important to let them know kind of the results of a meeting, even if they weren't there. And make sure they are in the office when clients come to town. It goes without saying, anytime I've ever met with agency partners, 
when I was on the client side or when I was playing that role, um, it was certainly important to, to have all the top brass from the agency side there in the office uh, when, when clients come to visit. Account, man account managers can also be trusted uh, as a friend and a confidant, so that's more of a personal thing, but that's really what we do here, honestly, and this is why I think a certain type of person who is very gregarious and, and uh, um, you know, empathetic to the client uh, is really what they're looking for as well, especially on the day-to-day -day stuff, right? It's a relationship you're cultivating here, and the better that relationship is, the longer and longer standing your relationship with the client will be. Uh, they, hear, uh, they like to hear things about your personal life at points, and they're also busy, uh, often too busy to have friends, so you're kind of it. Um, all right, so that's the client side. Uh, let's talk about creatives now. So clients, okay, obviously that's pretty straightforward. You understand kind of what they want. It's a business, right? You gotta be mindful of the four P's and the fact that they have their own kind of worries. And you wanna remove the worries of the creative side of things and the, and the marketing and advertising side so they can focus on the other stuff. Uh, that's kind of the goal for the client in a nutshell. Creatives, completely different animal, right? Uh, let's talk about them. So these are the folks that obviously work on the creative team and pretty much everybody in an agency has some sort of quality like that. Um, what do they want? So let's let's talk about that. And again, we gotta manage both sides of this, right? It's two sides of the same coin. They want someone who gives insightful input and can write a good creative brief. That's the core and that's the thing we do. That's like I said, that's ground zero for us as account folks. Can you craft? Uh, not just well-written uh, brief, but a strategic brief. Uh, they want uh, they want to read a brief that's going to give them uh, a really spark great ideas on creative um, stuff that really just generates good ideas. Um, they also want you to recognize how hard creative uh, creative development can be, and it certainly is. And we've all known what writer's block is, and certainly that by extension, just more largely, how do you come up with a concept that's meaningful and game-changing? Not always easy to do, as we know. Um, and if they want you to help, a lot of times creatives kind of are over the place. I have ADD, a little bit of that myself, which is, I think, a superpower uh, because you can think of a lot of great ideas. But again, uh, account folks need to kind of corral those ideas back to one key problem and focus around that key problem as much as possible. So you, you got to be able to rein them in, and that's what they want. They want guidance and the direction. They want someone who will passionately have their back, uh, but yet still also provide objective opinions on the creative work. Um, so strong opinions based on an objective and explainable point of reference. And actually, we talked about that um, in week eight uh, in our lecture. We talked about how the subjectivity versus objectivity of, of creative. Now, obviously, we want to be as objective as possible. And we talked about 20 ways to do that. They're looking for you to play that role as much as possible. And the brief, creative brief is kind of, uh, like I said, the Bible for that, uh, that activity. Once you've got that nailed down, that's something you can refer to often when it comes to creative development. They want to challenge mediocre work and ask hard questions. So that's that's really kind of the, the, the really difficult thing to do with creatives is to really lay in, uh, provide good feedback without hurting people's feelings. All right. Uh, creatives also want someone who personally embraces the creative work. So, you know, the best account folks I've had are also really, really strong creatives who just happen to have a, a, an ability to manage people and... Uh, and be somewhat organized. Um, but they want someone who embraces the creative work. Once it's good, uh, let them know that, but then be excited about it and love it. And of course, oftentimes you're the one who's pitching the creative. So they want to make sure you're going to pitch it correctly as well. Uh, they want to show off the work. And they certainly, because a lot of times, again, it's the, they're going to be in the sidelines, not presenting to the client. You're taking their baby, basically, and presenting that. So uh, show off the work. Uh, be proud of it, right? Keep it up in the office. Show the team you're proud of, of the, the part that they've played. They also want someone who does a great job presenting, like we talked about, right? And defending creative work to the client. A lot of times, creative teams really love the edgier stuff, right? And I as well. I like pushing the envelope and making, uh, pushing clients to the edge of their comfortability. Uh, and that's kind of oftentimes what happens. Now, you'll, you'll probably have something that's a little more edgy and sometimes a little safer. More often than not, the creative team will want you to push for that uh, more edgy piece. But... Um, Either way, they want you to defend the work that's been done. A couple points here. Ask the creative team to coach you on what to say. That's that's a great point, asking the creative team to coach you on what to say. And well, so maybe you're not clear on something about how to, how to present it. Uh, doesn't hurt to ask the creative team that. Uh, creatives tend to, to work harder for an account manager who believes in and defends their work, obviously, right? So if you're going to be a champion for what they're doing, they're going to work their butts off for you. 
Last one, your pushback on the client changes to get, get the why and not the what. That's the other one too. Clients are very um, malleable and they don't always see the timelines as we've known, right? Sometimes things take a little longer than they ever expected and usually that's the case. So we've got to kind of play that role and wherever possible, we're looking to create enough time so that the, the creative team can, can create good work. They also want someone who understands and respects the creative process. And again, there's, this is uh, not, a, not a pretty, uh, always a pretty process. Uh, it takes time, talent, frustration, and stress. There's a lot of that, certainly, as you go through the process. And as we've watched a few of these pitch episodes, you see, generally they have a week to pull something out of their rear ends um, that's meaningful and based in research and, and good, frankly. Um, not always easy to do, right? So that's a stressful sort of piece. And understanding that process is important for us. Don't smother them or breathe down their necks. And we give them space, but also provide direction. So be hands-on, but also collaborative. They want someone who gives ample time for creative minds to work. So you need you need space, right? For me, a lot of times I'll go to sleep and think uh, as I'm falling asleep about a creative uh, a creative problem, and then a lot of times I'll have a little nugget of an idea that kind of I rise up with, and that's kind of where it starts for me. But uh, everybody's different, right? Um, they aren't thinking two four seven. Just know that they can't turn it off. There's no control over timing when a big idea comes. So you just got to kind of be a farmer of those big ideas when they come. But know this, it does take time, right? And on the pitch we watch, they have a week. But usually the average turnaround time on any creative takes two weeks. Um, what creators want, they also want someone who can inspire. Uh, so obviously the creative brief is really the, the document we use there. That's the starting point. And that brief, you should put a lot of TLC into that, tender loving care, because that's really where all of your best ideas about how to handle the brand and the client's business through creative that's where it's going to be kept right but that that document should provide a spark and by extension then your own uh your essence because uh, you're going to exude whatever you've written on that creative brief is going to come out through your interactions with with your creative team so providing that spark being a good salesperson of course and be excited about the boring even the boring stuff right uh still being excited about that as a in totality and then always lead by example so don't just preach practice what you preach they also want someone who's creative in their own right. I, I, I can't stress this enough. Most people think of account folks as people who like to manage spreadsheets and uh, relationships and is more like the client. I would say uh, it, it certainly doesn't hurt, and it's, it's frankly uh, what separates the good from the great account folks is uh, being creative in their own right. So when you get a good idea that comes out of the creative team, you can actually make it better, and I've seen that happen a number of times where you're on the same wavelength and you have a creative idea, and then you make it, uh, uh, you improve upon that idea and being collaborative. So I guess basically participating in the creative process without actually doing the creative is kind of what you, what you want to get to there. They love, creators love when uh, you have account, they have account folks who take some risks so and push the clients like we've discussed. They also want someone who knows how to work with creative people generally. Um, and that's a tough one as well. A lot of times you get people of all stripes who work at an agency and maybe they don't have a college degree but they're really, really good at design. Um, so you don't want to flaunt your education if let's say you got a master's degree in, in advertising uh, or whatever communication or whatever uh, put that on put, set that aside uh, and deal personally with folks right they like that um, minimize paper and electronic communication wherever possible with creatives uh, the face-to-face -face is always better so going around the campfire and, and chatting with people at their desk uh, get to know them as people. Uh, always ask good questions. And again, it's just like the client, really. They, they are people as well. They have friends, interests. And the more you get to know them and the better relationships uh, that evolve, the better off the work's going to be. Uh, other things here, question things, be honest. Uh, simplify things wherever possible. Uh, certainly have an opinion and don't make fun or look around down your nose at their different clothes, hair, or lifestyle. So a lot of times you get folks who are on the creative side who you know, are, are living the dream, right? They're living their life. They're living the creative lifestyle, and that's awesome, right? So um, encourage that. All right, so that's what creatives want. Uh, so again, in summary, the, the balance is, is a neat one, right? Uh, managing the client side, which is more uh, left brain, uh, more about the facts, uh, the four Ps, product place, price, and promotion, and the bottom line. And then you got the, the creative team uh, on the right-hand side or the right brain, it's more about creative output, and uh, obviously never the twain shall meet, right? Uh, well, actually, there's um, a way to make both work really well together, and as we know, 
from creative endeavors, we need both. We need the left brain and the right brain to work in concert. And that's really what we do in account, is we manage both sides. I want to talk next about uh, something called account planning, which is a newer sort of facet of advertising. It's uh, something that might intrigue you. But what is an account planner? It's a newer discipline, like I mentioned, right? It's a hybrid between research and creative. So these folks kind of use the internet a lot, use the internet a lot uh, for sure, and then and research tools, and they really dig deep into the client uh, and kind of what's going on with the brand, uh, the, um, the competitive set. Uh, the, of course, the target audience, all that stuff they take into account and they do, they go deep, deep, deep into the research. And that's usually how it starts. They start looking at research and they try to uncover ideas. In my J322 class, Media Planning and Buying, I encourage folks to do this very thing. And then, of course, being able to kind of conceptualize creative as well is the other side of that. So having the idea, so really it's tip to tail. One person walking agency uh, rolled up into one person almost in a way and some people do this well. Uh, actually, I play this role in my own agency, Killer Insight, uh, because it's me and one other person. But uh, uh, generally speaking, if you find this person, they're worth their weight in gold. Uh, it's a, really a mix between uh, a creative strategist and a qualitative researcher. They make sure the customer's perspective is re represented in the creative process. That's, that's an important piece of this, right? Uh, and that's always it, customer first, right? So we're always looking for, for, for folks and, uh, you know, voice of the customer, uh, creative that speaks directly to our target customer wherever possible. So how do you do that? Of course, understanding the consumer psyche and not just demographic information, but going deep and, and understanding psychographic information. They also see how emotions drive behavior, right? So a lot of the best campaigns really focus on the higher order emotional sort of quality of, of any kind of given uh, creative, right? So looking at the emotional quality when that's, again, that's the right brain side of things, right? Looking at those inner motivations, beliefs, fears, desires that the consumer might have. Again, it all rolls back up to understanding the consumer's perspective in a detailed way. Uh, what makes people tick, right? And finding those consumer insights. Last week we talked, last time we talked about consumer insights, how to do that a little bit. We talked about laddering techniques. These are the folks who would probably more than likely engage in laddering techniques based on their research. So finding creative, uh, key, key consumer insights, we talked about this already. This is kind of how folks, sorry about that. It sounds like there's a fire going by here. Uh, so this eye chart here is really about what, what a, a, an a competent, a competent account planner might think about a given client. And these are the three, um, three concentric circles here that we want. And in the, in the center of that is, of course, the insight, the consumer behavior, and a communication strategy that's laying in there and waiting to be discovered. Uh, but it starts with looking at strategic planning, all right? All the brand strategies, so this is all what the client might be focused on, right? Um, and through the marketing brief. And then of course the creative planning, right? That's the other side of this thing here. And at the bottom here, engagement planning, how do you go out there? What's the media agency strategy? All of those three circles here kind of roll up to the middle part here, that insight is what we're looking for. One thing I want to mention about this, as well as you know, thinking about the intended outcome is what we do, and it really comes again back to the consumer's point of view, executionally and emotionally. It's got to be relevant to the target audience. Whatever you do, it's got to mean something to your target, um, and usually that's uh, been teased out through research. Planners challenge conventional advertising wisdom, bring friction, and they provoke at every turn, right? So planners are going to come in, they're going to be armed with the facts, and they're going to challenge perceived, like long-held traditional ideas about the client's target audience uh, and go to market strategy. So we, we've got to be kind of provocateurs that way. Um, and our goal here obviously is inspiring the unexpected creative approach, which is really what they're looking for. Ultimately, they don't know it yet, but they're looking for that big idea that really is a game changer for them, right? Uh, but it's always about connecting with the target audience. How do you get there? So obviously research is a big part of what we do on account planning, right? It's surveys, focus groups, in-depth interviews, voice of the customer sort of Watch people buy our products when I worked at Briggs & Stratton. We'd watch them buy them, take them home, unbox them, and, and observe kind of how long it took them to get a lawnmower working or a pressure washer or a generator. Uh, but there's a lot of insights that come out of that. So we're always looking for those aha moments through consumers and how they interact with the products. Audience segmentation, database studies, et cetera, all of those things. Uh, uh, societal change trends, research. So we're looking at kind of stuff that's out there in a boilerplate fashion, like trend research and generational stuff like Gen X versus Gen Y. Uh, and then, of course, stuff that we uncover through our own um, work. We're not researchers, right? Researchers are passionate about the research and the past. 
So account planners are passionate about advertising consumers and predicting the future. So we're not pure researchers per se, right? We're looking kind of at the current state and it's always again through the lens of the consumer. We're also not creatives, right? Real friction occurs when planners try to write, design, and ideate. So don't make any mistake about that, right? So we're not actually going to be writing copy or creating ads necessarily, but we're going to be pointing people in that right direction, right? Uh, where fertile ground lies. We don't replace account executives either, right? In approval of ideas and things like that, the account executive is a separate function. And as we know, uh, account folks manage a lot of things, but uh, the account planners are kind of on their own a little bit. And they're meant to be one part researcher, one part creative, but neither uh, of those two pieces are their primary primary function. While the fit and workflow may be challenging with planners, they do provide invaluable services. So it's not something that you're going to actually get. You got to that, that's an upcharge in most cases. Agencies will offer these account planners to go out and really kind of, and this could be like 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 this is generally. Uh, if, if, if clients have the money, this is where you really start seeing some of the best creative work come out of uh, this decision. But uh, while they, the fit and workflow may be challenging with planners, they do provide invaluable services, right? So a huge amount of research the account and creative teams would have not have done, had time to do is really what they do, right? Uh, they have unique interpretive skills. That's the other thing. That's the secret sauce with these account folks. Um, they're able to take a, a lot of data and tease out the best parts, and they're looking for those insights. These are the ones, these are the folks who often are uh, keen on finding those unique insights. Their interaction with the creative team can free up the account manager for larger strate strategic work as well. So a lot of times you'll see the, uh, these account planners working with the creative team. What, you know, what can happen when you have an account planner kind of working on staff with you? And I guess the greatest example of this would be uh, from some time ago, back in 91-ish, uh, um, for the Stay Smart campaign for Holiday Inn Express, um, which is obviously geared toward a certain type of person, and obviously they did their homework, uh, but it took an account planner to kind of pull together this, this, this campaign. And essentially what it is, they were an up-and-comer, obviously not the biggest budget, in the world, holiday back in the day, Holiday Express was uh, not a destination point for a lot of travelers. Uh, so they did their homework. They uncovered uh, a target audience that they entitled the Road Warriors, which is a type of person who travels, at, but ultimately ends up being in hotels over the weekends because they travel a lot for work. Uh, and I was one of those folks, so I was actually a Road Warrior as well. So kind of resonated to that idea. But um, um, essentially, through their research, they uncovered the fact that um, you know being smart means not having to spend the most money. Uh, on a place to stay. You uh, you want to stay in smart places, and then when you do stay in a smart place and you get a good night's sleep, you behave intelligently as well, and you way above your station. And that's really what this uh, set of commercials is for here. So let's take a look at one of these here. Let's see if this. Hey, hey, look at me. Lock in. Crusher here has an extra deltoid muscle. Means he's got exponentially greater bucking propulsion. Now you lean back and you hang on. I'll be there. You rodeo clowns are a lifesaver. Rodeo clowns? Yeah. Stay smart. Stay at a Holiday Inn Express. All right, so there's plenty of other examples. This campaign definitely has what we call legs in the industry. Uh, so in other words, lots of different ads that with the basic, same basic premise in, uh, in that if you stay at Holiday Inn, it's a smart decision. By extension, then you're going to be afforded a lot more intelligence uh, that you may not, don't deserve normally. Uh, well, smart campaign, generally speaking, that came out of this and uh, really transformed the company. They went from a small kind of nothing burger uh, outfit to one of the largest chains of uh, business-focused um, places to stay. Um, so a really cool idea there, and it transformed the company, and actually the Stay Smart uh, branding kind of took hold and actually overtook the entire company. So uh, bars of soap and coffee and everything else was appointed with the Stay Smart sort of strategy and moniker so uh, really a good example of how account planning can lead to really big changes for for companies and, and certainly in the case of holiday and express that was the case last thing i'll leave you guys with here before we part ways is just a couple more links and i'll put these into week 11's folder in our canvas site but these are two examples short one short one here of what it's like to be an account planner and what they do a day in the life so she'll talk about that and of course over here is another little longer version of that so Take a look at those if it's something you're interested in. I think certainly either way, 
you, you want to take a look. But uh, these folk, these folks make really good money uh, as well. If you're good at what you do, you can make really good money as an account planner. A couple of last things I want to talk about. Discussion post six in keeping with this week's discussion about client and creative relationships and managing those and what we have to do as, a, as account folks. Um, you're going to find, sorry, my mic was away from me. Um, you're going to find uh, this uh, intriguing because ultimately it's a, it's a situation. I'm not going to read this, but it's a hypothetical asking you to kind of, what would you do in this situation if you had a situation where you had a new, direct, a new creative director who wants to make comps? And you also know, because you're the account person, that the client uh, sees those as unnecessary. Uh, and you've got a, a, a situation where both have strong-minded opinions about each. How do you handle that? How do you preserve the relationship with both the creative and the client? So that's it. And then, of course, you want to kind of weigh in on that as well as other people make their own comments. The last thing, too, I want to remind you guys, obviously coming up here uh, by Friday next week, uh, our book reports are due. So, And as we know, we are going to do these, and we're, we're doing these, uh, we're posting these to our threads. And then, of course, then you're going to have uh, feedback required as well, which I've given you direction on. So that's coming up. So just uh, be aware of that one around the corner. That's all I got. The uh, last thing I want to leave you guys with is obviously don't let this coronavirus get you down. It can, and it has done for me sometimes as well, but then I remind myself that it's something I can't control. The things I can control are washing my hands and uh, staying home with my family and enjoying this quiet time with, with people I love. Hopefully you're with somebody you love right now and just making the best of it. And don't sweat it too much. It's going to be rough. We're going to have a couple of rough weeks here, but um, ultimately... Uh, you can control your attitude about it as well. So uh, in this case here, I'm asking maybe not to flip it off, but uh, certainly don't let it get the best of you. Um, with that, I'll leave you guys, and I'll talk to you next week. Let me know if you have any questions about any of the stuff we've discussed here. Uh, I'll talk to you soon.